So some of what we have on our agenda this afternoon is to just understand a little bit more about the demographics of the, the workforce um, in both of the systems. Um, and so we wanted to start first with our human resources at the state level and understand uh, some of the demographics um, of our state workforce. And, uh, and so I see you've prepared us a wonderful presentation. <coughs> we'll let you go ahead and take it away and then hopefully there will be time for questions at the end. And I, I just wanna throw in here that if anybody has questions beyond this with the um, on our on the state workforce, the workforce report that this is just part of it, but the workforce report that's done every year is really thorough and does, gives everything like temporary employees and how many there are and where they are, and limited service employees, and everything. So it's a really good report if you're interested in the state workforce at all. All right. Well, thank you, Senators White and. Representative. We're going to, first of all, I think we should do this. We did with this with Beth for Beth. And um, <clears throat> we're going to in, just introduce ourselves and who, why we're here, wh who appointed us, so that um, you'll know where, where we're from. So, Corey, do you want to start this time? Sure. Senator Corey Parent. Um, I was appointed by the uh, command, please. Dan Trogger, uh, appointed by the Troopers Association. I am Leona Watt, and I was appointed by the ESU. I'm Kate, appointed by Mama NJ. John Gannon, <coughs> appointed by the Speaker of the House. Sarah Copeland Hansis, appointed by the Speaker of the House. Jeanette White, appointed by the Committee on Committees. Eric <coughs> Davis, appointed by VSCA. Andrew Emmerich, kindergarten teacher, appointed by Vermont. I'd like to check the commissioner the Department of Education. I'm Molly, I'm a teacher appointed by Vermont. Thank you. Okay, now okay. take it away. <laughs> I'm Beth Fastigi. I'm the Commissioner of Human Resources uh, for the state of Vermont. And with me today is Harold Schwartz, who's our Director of Operations, and Doug Pine, who's the Deputy Director of Operations. And um, and uh, the committee asked us to come in and talk about some specific demographics of the workforce. So as uh, Senator White pointed out, one of her favorite reports of which uh, Doug Pine is actually the guru of that report. So he gets to hear your, your praise in person is our workforce report. We publish that every January. So there's a lot of information. The web address is right here. And if um, you're online, you should be able to click through it through the presentation. Um, but lots of statistics on there. Some of the slides we have updated with fiscal year 21 data and some are fiscal year 20 data. So we, but the ones we could, we tried to um, update. Um, the first two pages that have executive branch at a glance for fiscal year 2020 on here, um, we're not gonna go into these in detail here because I have a lot of slides that kind of elaborate on those. But what I just wanna say at first is this is the executive branch at a glance. It's not the judiciary or the legislative branch. So the uh, folks that participate in the retirement system, there are judiciary as well as legislative branch folks that participate in the retirement system. This report and these statistics don't really um, count them. If you're adding those together, it's about 10,000 employees. So I'm sure the um, treasurer will have information on the number of participating in the retirement system of those. Um, and this is for fiscal year 2020. So this is data that's good up until um, June of 2020. Um, we have had another fiscal year in the meantime, but our report for next year isn't, isn't generally um, submitted until uh, January. So going through some of these numbers here, just the number of employees, I have a whole slide on that. So I'm actually gonna skip talking about that, um, but, um, this also talks about full-time equivalents, and it's very, most of our employees are full-time, and you can see that related to there. The average age of employees, um, we don't, we break the report out a lot by um, the generation we call that, and I'll go over that in another slide. Average years of service as well, um, and the length of service, we have um, slides on as well, um, as well as the um, percentage record, um, represented by a bargaining <coughs> unit. You can see in the classified, in the state service as made up of classified and exempt employees, um, only typically only, um, mostly only classified serve employees are 
eligible to be um, members of state unions. And so overall about 85% um, represented by a union in the executive branch, but um, it's the 92% classified versus 42.2% exempt. And I can go over for of the people in a bargaining unit. So there's a small number of exempt employees in the bargaining unit. Um, talent acquisition, that's about recruitment. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, we do have a slide um, on numbers there, but we did in fiscal year 2020, we hired um, 938 employees. Most of those are classified employees, 880 classified employees with 58 exempt employees. Can, and, that, that, yep. <coughs> of that 938, <clears throat> were how many do you know how many were replacing other employees or how many were actually new positions for fiscal year 22 i can pretty confidently say it's it's less than a wash we actually decreased okay. uh, positions i think in fiscal year 2020 and fiscal year 2020 okay. so it might have been a new position doing something different but it would have replaced somebody doing okay. something else all right thanks um, and then we have the average age of hires there and we go down around by demographics. Um, one of the things uh, we were asked to talk some more specifically about um, the number of people with how many years of service um, and related to retirement, employee salaries, open positions, um, hard to fill positions. So we will go through that. Also the amount of overtime, which is, um, there's some numbers on the next page. We didn't go into detail until the overtime as well, but you can find that in the workforce report, tables 53, 54A and 54B give overtime by department over, <coughs> over a series of years. So if there are folks that are interested in that, that's available in the workforce report as well. Um, on the next page, this is just basically the first at a glance page on the workforce report. We do talk, we'll be talking about turnover, retirement eligibility, overall compensation, and then, um, we don't get, uh, in these slides, we don't get too into equal opportunity employment or, um, or demographics, whether um, male or female, but that's all in the workforce or two. We have a big section on that. So um, <clears throat> table two is on, I don't know if your report is numbered, but it's page five. So this is the size of our workforce and it kind of tells the growth of the workforce over time. You can tell the um, blue part on the bottom, the majority of our workforce is classified with um, the numbers of exempts at the top. So um, fiscal year um, between 2020 and 2021, we actually we were pretty level between 2019 and 2020, just up by um, 17 people. Um, and most, 20, up 20 and classified down three exempt. But then if you move into fiscal year 21, we did go down from, um, 8,317 to uh, 8,012 um, employees. Um, we had a hiring freeze for a good part of the pandemic. If you remember during the pandemic, we were very concerned about the economy and our revenues for the state. So we wanted to make sure that um, we didn't, we had enough resources to pay employees. And so we were very careful about, about hiring um, in fiscal year 21. But we definitely expect that number of employees to bounce back and likely increase in fiscal year 22. As you know, the legislature has authorized a bunch of new positions in state government with um, that are going to be used in line with the uh, American uh, AR, A -A -R, not A -A -R -P, A -R ARPA funds. So we've got um, we're anticipating a lot of new hires and to um, increase the number of employees um, in the coming year. Yeah. Could I just uh, ask that, that that decrease in 21, um, was that accomplished mainly through attrition or like not you know, holding yes. positions open? Yeah, holding positions open. We had um, we did not have any uh, layoffs as a result or as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, just we may have had a layoff bit related to no work in that area, but but not uh, we did not do any furloughs or any layoffs as a result of. Um, the economic situation related to the pandemic in the Thank state. You. Yep. You. So I have table seven, <clears throat> which is a little easier to read. And that does break down um, the percentage of employees by classified and exempt. Um,
also have age distribution on there. The average age of a state employee is 45.3 years old. Um, you go into the um, generational things, but which gener that's, those are not generational. Those are 10 year ages, but then we also talk about um, generation and different generations and where they're aging out of the workforce a little bit later. <clears throat> Would you tell me, um, if I don't, maybe you're gonna do this later, but I am always confused about who is generation X, who's a millennial, and who's a generation Z. Yes, we do have I, that for I, you. I, I never can. Let's flip over. I know baby boomers. It's <laughs> table, table 16B. <clears throat> oh, okay. On page eight, if, you're, if okay. you numbered your pages, but um, on the table there, it does talk about how it, this kind of shows the changing demographics. So the um, baby boom generation is the blue circles on that graph. And it shows that's the generation that's um, born between 1964 and 1946. So that's age 57 to 75 in, in the 2021. <coughs> So you can see the um, as that age group retires, begins to retire and, and move out of the workforce, you see those numbers decreasing over time where you see the millennials really increasing as well as the generation X, which is, uh, I'm, I'm on that generation X, which is 1965, right? So I, I'm, I missed the baby boom by one year. So 65 to? 65 to 80. So that's the biggest makeup of our workforce right oh, I, now. I see, there it is. And when you combine both, <coughs> both okay. uh, um, Generation X and Millennials, that's the okay. majority of our workforce. That's about 72% of our workforce. Um, and I think we can probably just, if I'm not sure if I need to even go through any of the, those other slides anymore. We probably can just stay on the slides. Um, oh, no, let's go back one slide to seven, you'll see um, length of, which I think is important for this group, it's the length of service based on age distribution. So the biggest distribution of employees is actually less than five years uh, as a chunk. <laughs> uh, and then it's divided up into 10 year chunks along that. So uh, also 34% have worked here between five and 15 years. You've got, um, 15 to 25, 34%, and then, oh, yep, no, that's 18%, and then 25 to 35 years, that's 7.8% of our employees, and then over five, 35 years is 2.1%. So that, I think, is, a, is a, it was kind of important statistics for this group to be talking about when you're thinking about pension changes, um, just the kind of the age, the length of service for state government, definitely impacts um, where they are on the pension scale and actually what what pension plan they're in. Um, the annual base salary distribution um, also is there. Most employees um, make between 55 and $65,000 per year. That's 25% of employees. And you can see um, the numbers surrounding that are make up more and then kind of tapering graph it. Um, yep, go ahead, Doug. I was going to say on the length of service, um, it's, uh, the fact that uh, the large percentage is less than five it is indicative of the fact that uh, the greatest amount of turnover, the highest percentage of turnover happens in the first five years. So we have a lot of people with five or fewer years of experience. And uh, if we keep them more than five years, generally, they're not going to a very large percent of return happens in that first five years. That's that's what the percentage is so high. And oh, I'm wondering, do you have the length of service um, connected with age as well? Do you have that broken down separately somewhere? I'd, I'd just be curious to know what the age is on some of these people here. Less than five years, you're from five to to fifteen. Um, just to kind of get a sense of the workforce, it's a lot of people entering second careers or. Um, some in the, in the last slide, we go into that a little bit. Is that something we could give uh, more information for another time? If you don't have that today? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so for the length of service, 
connected to their age. Um, so, you know, some people who are 30 maybe are in that five to 15 years of service already at that point. However, there might be a lot of people that are less than five years at age 30 or just kind of continuing to go through that kind of age progression. I know you had it broken down by about 10 year chunks um, before. I'd love it if it could even be less than 10 year chunks. Um, I mean, if you have 26.6% uh, of people age distribution between 45 and 54, but the majority of those 26% are at 53, 52. Uh, it just gives a wide gap. I'm just curious to see what it would also look like at a smaller age. We'll see what we can do. Uh, I did want to just, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, the length of service distribution, um, understanding this is a snapshot in time, I'm trying to think about how it connects to uh, the drivers on the, uh, on, the, on, on the pension side. Is this distribution typical or does it reflect a changing? Yeah, well, this, this is typical. If you go back, it's less than five, it's consistent with the highest group. Thank you. Very helpful. And we'll tie that on the last, very last page. We'll okay. tie that. Great. Thank you. One thing I did want to just let people know who aren't familiar with the terms classified and exempt employees. Um, uh, exempt employees are primarily attorneys that work for the state and then appointed officials. Those are the um, most common type of exempt employees. Um, but most most employees, career employees would be in, considered in the classified service except for, except for attorneys and um, that's fine to say. Yeah. Um, there is a statement. I think I need it. Yeah. Look in the big book if you want to. There's a table in the big book that talks about which types of positions would be considered exempt from the classified service. And, and classified service is just a different construct than they have in the private sector. But um, essentially, those employees have a property interest in their job. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's more job protection than you might have in the private sector. Simplified. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Deputy Treasurer Clausen. Um, so the generational shift slide that we already kind of reviewed, that was our slide eight. And then moving on to slide nine, which is our total compensation for uh, classified executive branch employees. Um, we talk about the total compensation when we talk about kind of the value that employees receive for working for the state of Vermont and also kind of when we're talking about the cost of an employee. So total pay is a part of it. Um, so this average employee, total compensation for the average pay for an executive branch employee may make $67,000 a year, but their um, total compensation was about $102,000 a year, close to $103,000 a year. The, the health insurance is a big part of that. $102,000 is 13% of that. Um, average $14,000 worth of health insurance policy. The retirement system value for the employee is about 14% of that $102,000. FICA, and then the other things, dental, workers comp, life insurance, kind of a tiny little part of that. Um, question on this slide, does retirement, does this represent the normal cost or does it include the amortization? That is the percentage of the total comp package that the employee is seeing the value on going to retirement. So it's not, it's not the 21.4%. Um, okay. Let's talk about that later, it's, <laughs> which I know you know, but. Thank you. Yeah. And then on the next page, it kind of breaks. Yep. I can just ask a question. If you, <clears throat> so the percentage of 67 to 102, would the kind of same percentage hold for other other positions? I mean, it's 
you add approximately the same percentage to the to get the total compensation package. Somebody with a lower salary will have a higher percentage of health insurance okay. in the total comp because you get the same health insurance plan value no matter if you make one hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars a year or if you make you know, $40,000 a year, again, the same value of health insurance, but retirement will change because that's a percentage based on a percentage of your salary, but the health insurance benefit is going to get, become a bigger percentage okay. as your salary lowers, the rest of them won't shift around very much. I just want to clarify the extra prior question. The 14,000 change for the retirement, uh, 21.4% that's the state retirement contribution in FY20. That represents that, but that's that's as a percentage of the pay, not as a percentage of the total cost. So you take the 14,000 divided by the 67,000, and that's the 20%. Okay. So I understand that. And the next uh, page on there, page 10, just puts the numbers out there for you in a different table and um, gives it in a bigger picture. So it's talking about the total cost of payroll for state government, the total pay, the total comp and benefits for fiscal year 2020. So that's um, you know $781 million when you're talking about compensation for state employees in that, in that time frame for classified employees, right? Where's that total comp? Yes, that's classified. Most of the workforce report, which is, is, is looks at data on the classified workforce. Um, it's a larger percentage of workforce and it's a good, it's a good approximation. Um, there are some exempt employees that do participate in the um, defined benefits pension plan. They have a choice. So some also participate in the defined contribution plan instead. And actually the next slide kind of, um, talks about this, this is the requir retirement contribution <clears throat> allocation as a percentage of pay. So this is what uh, Eric was asking about. Um, so the state share in fiscal year 21 was 21.4% of pay. And then due to um, mostly demographic changes, um, that percentage to continue to meet our obligations um, for the paying down of the liability of our retirement plan moved up this year, it's gonna be 25.5%. So that was a big increase over the past year. Um, and you can see also the employee share for the defined uh, benefits contribution is 6.65% of their salary and that will continue to be for fiscal year 20. And also, oh, there's another typo, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> That's a fiscal year 22 also um, moving over there. So there's a little typo there. Um, Right now, I think you probably know this already, but the other um, the other cost for retirement we call the OPEB, which is primarily the employee uh, the retiree health insurance, which we pay for now on a pay go basis. So that number in the, is in that twenty five point five percent is part of that state share that we're paying is to pay for the health care for people who have already retired. If we were going to start paying down that liability and just do a very simple amortization schedule for what our OPEP liability is, it would be we would need another nine percent on top of that payroll to pay that down. So that's just to give you a magnitude of that. Um, also on this graph, it's just is showing you that um, that the um, percentage of payroll costs allocated to um, retirement has been increasing over time, and it took in the past couple of years, um, it's taken quite a bump up. Um, we have also here, I just wanted to talk about the other two retirement options we have. We have the defined compensation plan, which is an option that exempt employees can choose. So the state share for that is 11%. There's no liability there because the state pays into it. And then once they pay that, it goes into a fund that's pretty much managed by the employee and the employee share for that is 2.85%. And then all employees have the opportunity to participate in the deferred compensation plan, which they can save um, up to a lot of money. Yeah. And it, they can choose before tax or after tax. So that's another good way for, to save for retirement. There's no state match to that, but it's still a good saving, savings tool. 
did you say that some uh, workers have the option to be in the defined benefit program? They can choose to be in the defined benefit first being in the defined contribution plan? Right, when exempt employees have an opportunity when they're hired to choose which plan they want to go into. Okay. So I'm an exempt employee. I was appointed in 2017. I had the opportunity to change to choose if I wanted to go with the defined benefit pension plan or the defined contribution um, based on my age. Um, I have retirement savings from previous employment. Um, it's an appointed position, so I serve at the pleasure of the governor. Um, the governor serves in two-year terms. I felt for me the best um, plan to go would be the um, uh, the defined uh, compensation right. plan rather than the defined benefit plan. Um, Once you make a decision, is there the opportunity to change, or is it it's a one time you get to choose? Yes, one time. And right? No. Nope. Uh, so if I had a different job, if I if 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 I yeah, <laughs> or Doug's job, <laughs> if I took one of their jobs in the in a competitive process, of course, <laughs> I I would have that choice again. I would have that. I would I would either, I could choose to go into the defined bank of money. I just have one more follow up. That, sure. Uh, when employees are presented with this choice. Um, what type of resources are there for them to access so they're made aware of these choices? Um, you know, choosing retirement plans in general is um, really scary for most people. So I'm just right. curious about the education that's provided to workers. It is, yeah, it's a smaller percentage of our workforce. Um, and as I said, those are, those employees that make that choice are either um, about 42% of those are attorneys. Um, and a, the, a lot of them are appointed officials. We do have an exempt employee handbook. And of course the um, retirement office is always available to talk and they have uh, retirement counselors. And we also have um, our partner Prudential that also can talk to employees about what to choose. There's a certain amount of time it takes that you have to make that decision. Okay. So what is that, can you? Right, so when, when a state employee is hired, uh, exempt position, they're on that default into the plan. Some generic projections with multiple plants to give us a sense of what um, difference about the plan. And then it's a commission state, but also plan of information. Information about 60 days from the data that might be So they can say that they don't make a decision, they'll stay in the plan. Regarding the 457 plan, the deferred plan, what percentage of employees take advantage of that? I don't know. Because I believe my head. that's the plan where you can put somewhere close to twenty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And that's actually that's what you know. That's actually what I do. <laughs> I max out, max that out every year. We have that on the all the research data. Ha and all the VSERS report, it talks about the number of people that are enrolled in that plan. Um, I just don't have it at the top of my head. But, oh, great. Thank you. I'll let everyone it's always good to have the deputy treasurer in the room. <laughs> well, I just had a quick question that I missed as you were talking about it. When you were talking about at the, the top left of that page, um, the 25.5%, and then you said if you included the OPEP, was that on the entire? So, so the way, yes. Yeah, so the way, uh, I think it, this may be the same for the, I don't know how it works for the teacher system, but for the um, state employee system, there's no, um, we're paying for all of the retiree benefits out of the current costs of the okay. government. So it's the retiree. So this, the OPEB portion in there, it, there's, you know, that is the amount we're collecting uh, as a percentage of payroll. Part of that goes basically directly to the treasurer's office, and they use that to pay for the retiree health care, yeah. which goes back to HR. Would take an extra nine percent. Right, it would take an. Uh, we'd have to add another nine percent of the payroll to start paying that down, and okay. we've been, you know, that's one of the things that um, that 
the groups have been looking at this for years is how to pay down those four buckets, those four buckets of liability, and, and that's one of those. Yeah. Is that when you say that it's nine percent? You just mean that that's going to cost nothing. That would that if we were to fund it the same way we are funding the ADAC, we would. Um, that's what we would have. That's that was how we would do it. That's not the way we necessarily would yeah. do it as a state. That's. Yeah. Understood. Oh. Um, Beth. Um, what percentage of exempt employees take part in the deferred compensation plan versus the defined benefit plan? I think we have a compensation plan. I mean, it's a. I mean, they have two options, as I understand it. They can do the defined benefit, or they can do the defined comp compensation plan. I was just interested in what percentage choose defined comp compensation versus defined benefit. Just to clarify, that, I think the terminology there should be defined compensation. Okay, I was just using the terms that we that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is contribution. DC versus DB. That's the percentage I'm interested in. Okay. So, and it would only be a percentage of the um, ex, of the 642, right? Yeah, it'd be yeah. the exempts yeah. only. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand that. I just, just intrigued. Yeah. But there are still there are some classified employees in that plan, correct? If they've been in, if they started an exempt service, they could potentially remain in the defined contribution plan. They'd have a balance, right? That would remain. And they wouldn't have to be put into defined benefit. If they went to stay in the defined contribution plan, it would still increase. But they could, if they went back and became a classified employee, they could still, they'd still keep their DC plan, right? You mean if they transferred to the defined benefit? No, no. If, if they're an exempt employee and they just chose the DC plan, but then became a classified employee that, that only would be able to participate in the DB, they'd still have a balance in the DC. No, they can't be Choose to remain in the DC or pick DB. That's the That's right. Yeah, I'm, okay. if they're going DC balance, balance roll over to their DB. Oh. Okay. Along with their years of service? Not once a while. Depends upon the salary at the time and what the value of the Because you're only the employee share in the defined contribution is only 2.85%. That's all the employees are paying. Where if they were participating in the defined benefits plan the whole time, they'd be paying 6.65%. Is that the right amount of the salary? All right. And is it a, can you make the assumption that the people who are on the defined contribution plan because they started as exempt employees are probably at a higher pay scale than the average salary of a state employee. Well, uh, probably if you look at the salary um, for exempt employees versus the salaries of classified employees, the exempt salary, average salary is higher. So yeah. probably, but we don't, I don't have the yeah. numbers behind that. Okay. Um, the next slide um, is moving toward um, recruitment and retention of employees. We talk about the state of Vermont value proposition. And these are just some of the things that um, employees get in return for um, what they bring to the organization. So when they work for a state of Vermont, oftentimes we are a stable employer. So we so that might appeal to somebody who um, is looking for stable employment. Um, and actually, I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn this over to the <laughs> dog. Um, all right. The, the value proposition. Um, this is a this is a concept that we use a lot in our talent acquisition work in terms of, and marketers also use value propositions. And so it's how you define given what we're going to give to someone. Work for us. 
Um, and so this is a, this isn't official. This is just a concept. Um, so the stable employment is is a big draw for us. Um, and as I said, we're not going to go out of business. And we're not going to be bought up by another corporation. Um, and so people who value that kind of stability of a large organization are attracted to employment. So that's something that we can use in terms of our outreach to find new employees. Um, work with a purpose is a huge part of, of our value proposition. Uh, so people who are mission driven, who want to be public employees serving the launchers are attracted to our organization. And we use that um, extensively in our outreach. If you see any of the stuff that we do, we talk about making a difference and work that matters and things like that. And there's a significant number of people who um, are uh, drawn to that kind of work. Um, I say decent pay. So we generally are at or lag the market. Um, we do have uh, consistent salary progression, so there's steps in our, in our pay plan. But highly competitive pay is not a strong part of our value proposition. We're not going to get big bonuses if we meet exceed sales expectations. Um, it's just not part of being a public um, Opportunity uh, is something, that, again, part of being a large organization. We have the opportunity to do training, development. People can move laterally and, and up uh, in the organization. And, um, you know, there are people that started from the, you know, uh, fairly uh, lower level positions and become commissioners. Um, so you can definitely build a career with us by moving around um, and taking advantage of the training and development that we have. So that's a, a very strong uh, part of our proposition. The feather on cap is our benefits. Without a doubt, it's one of the strongest things that we have. Um, so we have a fabulous um, medical benefits plan. You know, it's a low deductible, low copay uh, plan that covers all sorts of things. And in the market right now, generally what you're going to find is a high deductible plan that would make an HSA. You know, HSA would be great because it would make great investment uh, options, but we can't do that. But um, it's attracted to a lot of people, our benefits. So our recruiters really plug the, the, the benefits. And sometimes those benefits will offset pay differential. So we actually have a calculator on our website where you can plug in the numbers of what your, your pay is going to be and how much the state is contributing to your benefit plan. And often the numbers level out a little bit. And so you might take a little bit of pay cut, but you're going to get a much better benefit plan for your family. Um, so that is one of the things that just uh, really stands out for us. And of course, a retirement plan. Every organization is going to have this value proposition and retirement part of it. And we, we have a defined benefits convention. Um, and it is an important part of our overall value proposition, but it's far more complicated because a, a DB uh, is attractive to, for instance, people who really like a stable employer, um, plan on, on spending a Career with us, love our defined benefits. You know how much you have to put in, you know how long you have to work, you know what you're going to get. So, people who like that stability are, are really attracted to the DB. Um, we don't have other uh, demographics, it, it varies by occupational group. So, some occupations are, are very, it's, it's, it's a much stronger part of the value proposition. So, troopers, for instance. That's a really big part of the development. The troops don't generally grant your law enforcement officers. So it's something that you're going to transfer to another department. And so part of that work is, you know, also work for the purpose is extremely important for law enforcement. So part of the thing is you have mandatory retirement at 55 and, and a pension. And so it's very important for that occupation. There are other occupational groups that maybe aren't as focused on that. You know, that if you're a financial person, you can move around and do a lot of things. Um, there are also uh, generational differences. So we know, for instance, that millennials, uh, in particular, also uh, Gen Z, tend to 
move around a little. Uh, they, they six are you know, moving around from three to five years, changing jobs, and they hold six or seven different jobs in their career. And so to them, it may not be quite as attractive as something that might have more portability. There's all sorts of things that are written about that. So um, in terms of recruitment, whatever happens in terms of the change in attention will change our value proposition. Um, and what we're, what we're trying to uh, market to potential clients. Um, one of the things that occurred, and it's a very interesting lens to look through this whole debate, is, is the value proposition. I think it's very different for recruitment versus retention. Recruitment, these are new people looking at this is this proposition that you're given, what you're given. Um, for current employees, they already have something in their mind about what that value proposition was when they came. And so I think that's what conceptually, uh, you know, you've heard a lot of people saying, well, that's not what I signed on for when the public test with them. But, but behind that is in their mind is this value proposition that they they understood it to be a stable employer. They understood that they that they weren't going to be, they weren't going to get rich here, but they had great benefits and they had a unique and understood that that's what it is. So that's creates cognitive dissonance and then they're, they're like confused about why can that change? But a new employee is going to look at this and evaluate, does it, does it work for me? And so, so there, there's, a, there's a difference between whether it's going to affect our ability to recruit versus our ability to retain current employees. Yes, Sam. Uh, I have a question, and maybe we'll get to this later. But yeah, I know in education nationally, we're facing a crisis on the teacher shortage, um, and getting teachers to stay, you know, more than fifty percent or right around fifty percent leave the profession in the first five years of teaching. Um, and in Vermont, it's catching up to us the, the teacher shortage, um, and it's going to be a really serious problem. I'm wondering for the state of Vermont hiring. How have you seen, um, you know, the number of applications for positions coming in? What has that been looking like over the past couple of years? So that's a great meeting for the next slide. Fantastic. Unless there's any other questions, I'll go on to the next slide. Before we jump to the next slide, um, I don't, I don't know if this is in the workforce report, but do we have a sense of how employees um, connect with this value proposition? How they value? And this makes a lot of sense to me, but I just I just wonder how different groups of employees um, gravitate towards different parts, and I just don't know if they have any data. Yeah. Okay. I did see um, when you were talking about it as it relates to troopers. However, I did see Mike shaking his head. So. <laughs>
And so look at the number of requisitions that have five or fewer qualified applicants. It's gone up 42%. So we're approaching a third of our job openings. We only have five qualified people. That's not the same thing. Right? Um, that, that 674 number is large because often they don't find anybody after it closes and they have to repost it, they have to reopen it. So it's building that number, building up um, you know, gradually, you know, hiring, but it's it's really difficult. It's really difficult. Uh, sorry. I'm just curious if you have information on the number of people that are applying, what state they're applying from, where are they living? Are these Vermont residents or these out of state residents? I don't have specific specific. Yeah, it, it's hard to, to to mine our database because we don't. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's where we can we can make an address. They can run it on their address. So it's kind of hard to do. Uh, I would say the vast majority of our clients is probably the same percentage. I want to move here, I think so. I'm looking at your uh, sampling of hard to fill jobs and I'm saying, what's left? Governor, maybe? <laughs> I, I almost, I almost um, at the end said everything, um, but we did ask for some of the sampling. But any, anything in IT um, is, is very, very hard to find right now, especially things like security, you know, cybersecurity folks, um, PSAP dispatchers. Um, so we'll get the turnover in a little bit here, but our, our entry level emergency uh, PSAP dispatchers turnover on an entry level was over 80% in the last year. It's pretty hard to run a thing to have 80% turnover. Um, troopers are all, uh, have been very difficult. Nurses, folks, food service workers that are, are institutional settings, mental health specialists. We are counselors uh, because of the degrees that are required to do that. Family services workers are also social workers. Um, correctional officers, I mean, we can't not uh, look at the theater without the same crisis in staff. Um, AOT maintenance workers, um, they just instituted a thousand dollar sign up bonus for maintenance workers in a bunch of different classes. And it's a great concern that they, uh, you know, that we are working as hard as we can to ramp up and have enough people to follow the roads. And so they, they just instituted a thousand dollar sign up. Um, they also did that for custodians recently, you know, because they can't find um, wage differential. They can go to McDonald's and they're probably five bucks more. Um, Oh, okay. okay, I just have a, a quick question. So um, you're the Department of Human Resources. So how do you go about developing the other uh, divisions and stuff when they're trying to ramp up interest and maintain and also attract people to the jobs? Do you have, do you encourage those different HR departments to have programs and different outreach when they're recruiting? Is that part of your duty, we, so to speak? Have our division, the talent acquisition division, does recruitment for all centralized recruitment for all departments. Okay. So uh, aside, uh, troopers have kind of their own unit uh, that does recruiting, but all other jobs go through us. So we work directly with the department with the hiring manager to um, develop a strategy okay. at, the, at the very beginning of the process to say, you know, where where do you think we can find people and we develop a social media strategy, other types of outreach that, that we do using their own networks right. and uh, specialty uh, sites. So if it's a financial, financial sites, or things like that, but websites where they can use jobs. And so we, we customize a, a strategic kind of outreach for to each job over there. Right? And we work closely with the departments to like the, with the corrections and so on. Yes. No turnover. 
We got turnover. I think I think some of the turnover charts, table 34, where the next ones are turnover separations and um, historical look of employee turnover and retirement eligibility. I think we can go through those. Well, maybe relatively, maybe, maybe not. But if you look at table 34, this is typical for our workforce report. And you just notice that um, overall turnover for fiscal year 21. So this is additional information that's not in our workforce report, but in 2020 turnover was down. And, and this is, um, I think that people were valuing st stability during the pandemic. And then as we were coming out of it, that's when we started to see um, turnover and much of that is related to um, retirement. But during the, you know, in, in the heat of the crisis, I think people were, you know, even if they were eligible to retire, they were kind of, um, they were staying. <laughs> and then, and then they said, well, you know, maybe it's time for me to, maybe it's time for me to go. And I think there was certainly um, some people some concerned about the pensions being changed and that maybe helped inform some of their decision. But we, it was a high retirement year. Fiscal year 21 was a high retirement year. Low, following a low year on 2020, um, similar to fiscal year 2019 was one of the highest years we had had. Um, it's gonna show on another page, but um, absent a retirement incentive, incentive. So they are pretty high retirement years, those two years. Um, these, so these just talk about people who leave the workforce and the reason they're leaving. So whether it's voluntary termination or involuntary termination or retirement. So all those graphs are kind of broken out by this way. And then we talk about the number of employees on table 35 and the percentage. Um, and then the historical turnover going back to 1998 on table 31. And this is, um, yep, they, these all were, have, were updated with 21 numbers. Uh, I'm wondering for uh, when you're looking at the, the overall turnover um, with people leaving for retirement and voluntary termination, is there an exit interview process where people talk about the reasons why they're leaving the workforce or is there any sort of survey data you have where people um, are marking why they're leaving the workforce? And if so, um, do you have that over the past few years and are there changes in people's answers? We don't have a common place to uh, store exit interview data. So it, the um, departments, many departments do collect that information and um, use that as part of ways to maybe improve their working conditions there. I know Corrections has been doing, taking their exit interviews very seriously and the commissioner uh, reads all of the exit interviews to see uh, to, just to see how they're doing and why people are leaving. Um, so it, that is an important, it's a, it's a good tool that you can use to see why. I think a lot of, I, we think we know a lot of the reasons why people leave certain jobs, depending on what it is, if it's a pay or if it's a, if it's a morale problem. It's, we don't, we're not totally that surprised, I don't think, in inter, exit interviews. Because um, a lot of times people say, hey, I got a new job and I'm getting paid more. Or they usually, they usually tell you why they're leaving anyway. And one thing that is really good to do is if you're really trying to do employer retention is stay interviews and talk to those employees before they're leaving and have conversations with them about their careers and their career paths. And what's, you know, what do you think, do you envision you're working here in five years? Why or why not? You know, and try to get them to think about what it would take for them to say and what career path they want to follow. So it's, it's a very, it's a more individualized approach but it, that can really help towards employee retention. Is that happening? Uh, not nearly as much as we would like it to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the workforce report, right? Yes. And then we've got um, just project, projected retirement eligibility by fiscal year. So 
clearly as um, you move forward in time, more and more employees, if they stayed with state government, would be eligible to retire. And that's kind of what that's showing. And we show the numbers there too. And that's really good for workforce planning. If you, you know, if you estimate from your department, like a certain percentage of those eligible to retire will eligible will be eligible will retire, then you, you know, you can work on succession planning and what your recruitment might needs might be going forward. Um, can I ask a question about Table Thirty One? You've been talking um, a little bit in our task force about what happens when districts offer retirement incentives or buyouts or whatever you want to call them from district to district and how that affects the pension system. Um, it looks like also the state has provided a couple of times for that to happen too. And I wonder um, what those incentives were and why were they offered and how was that determined? It looks like there's Harold, a of errors. Either Harold, Harold or Michael maybe you could talk about those I know before my time. History. Um, and Michael, correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, a couple different times, I think a fifteen thousand dollar incentive yeah. was offered, and you get that in two different years. Um, the actual reason for that was I think they just wanted to keep the uh, the level of workforce lower, and and that would seem to only work if you don't allow people to fill those positions or equivalent positions immediately, at least. Michael may, may have been involved in part of that. Um, uh, from, I, I'm not aware of any follow-up studies that found that it, you know, it all, all the various actual impacts. Although we didn't, we didn't keep the positions open, most of them. Isn't that right? Right, the positions were open. The number of other positions that were filled surpassed what we got. Yeah. It was, it was more, it was less than a watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was. And, and the graph that we have, it was like on page five that talks about from 20, 2011 to 2020. You can see, you know, in um, between 2015 to 2016, the number of employees went down a little bit. But then when you look at the next year, it bounced right back up. So, it didn't have um, it didn't have the impact if that's if that was a goal to reduce total payroll right. costs, which I expect it was because um, you know that we had revenue issues. We were talking about that on the teacher side, and then when I saw this, I was like, "Wait, the state did it to themselves?" Mm -hmm. yeah. and the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> so to follow up on table thirty one that and that thread, um, and probably question really from Michael, but I'm thinking about what information the task force needs. And was there an analysis done at the time of those as to how it would in fact affect the retirement system? It's kind of I'm wondering if that data is available. I'll have to go back and look that up. Thank you. The money for the incentive though didn't come from the retirement system that came from sure. general fund, yeah. but one more question. So would that be paid out as uh, increasing total salary or is, would that be separate? So if they were, um, you know, had worked part of the year and it already made $70,000 and then um, took the retire retirement incentive with that, yeah. then that boosted their salary. No. No, they, they, they effectively retired and then received okay. that salary. So the question is, did they count those average time? Correct. Yeah. Yes, it's not. Okay. I just particularly remember that that caused so much turmoil in the office and all the different offices. Like, oh my gosh, so it was quite a time. I think we just have one more slide where um, Harold crunched some numbers um, talking about. So uh, I'm just gonna turn that on over to you. Okay. Yep. Um, this is our last slide. Well, um, what I wanted to do was. Uh, dig down a little, drill down a little bit into the demographic data that we have and try to map some of that data to um, whatever we know about retirement on the, on the HR side. Um, everything I'm going to talk about from now on in this meeting, the actuaries can and should do the, do the work. So uh, I'm just an analyst, I'm not an actuary. So. 
Um, so I took a look at the, the biggest group of potential retirees, which is group F. Um, and uh, there's two components to it, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but I, I split it by things that uh, one might be interested to look at when thinking about people retiring. There's a group from my calculations who are eligible to retire. This is data as of the end of February 20, who are eligible to retire because of their combination of their age and their service years. Okay. Um, and that was, there were 318 of them. The average age was 65. The average length of service was 19 years. And their average salary was around $72,000. Um, then there's a group who have 30 years of service in. They've essentially, they've maxed out their 50% their benefit. Um, there were 429 of those folks. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit where I have a suggestion that could probably save the pension system money, OPEP money, and give the employees the money. Uh, oh, the Harold would win with proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah I hear that, that would be nice. <laughs> subject to actuary saying <laughs> um, uh, those folks are average age of 60, and that's important when we talk about an OPEP impact later on. Uh, they have pretty lengthy life uh, service, and um, average salary, average base salary was $80,000. Uh, then there are some employees who um, could retire within five years. So the top two lines, those people could have retired right then. Uh, the additional people who could have retired within five years were another 671 uh, folks. Uh, their age is lower than the others. Their service is about 22 years. And you can see their base salary is around $75,000. And then I took a look at those not eligible to retire within five years. And that's a large group. That's over 1,500, over 1,500 people. Um, and their average age is 47, and their average service is 17 years. Um, uh, the additional retired within five years and not eligible to retire within five years are critical groups. So uh, it's important to take a look at that. Um, and then there's a the group F asterisk. And uh, I don't know if you've discussed that, but that's that's uh, group F folks who have started uh, after July of 2008. Um, and there's 4,700 of those. Um, so you get a total of around 7,600, average age around 45, 46, length of service 11, and the salaries in the $63,000 range. Um, so if you just looked at that bottom line, you wouldn't have all the detail that's above. So I wanted to give you that detail. I think that might be usable. Um, yes, you have a question. Will we get this for all? Do you have this available for all the groups? Um, I don't have it available for group B or group C. Okay, but you have it for both. the actual work. Well, th these, that's the only groups left. Group A has one person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, could you get that for us? <laughs> <laughs> Only at the average, though. <laughs> um, so I'd like to get to a suggestion based on this data. So if you look at the second line down, and I don't have a handout for it, so I'll, I'll walk through it down and try to be pretty uh, careful about that. Look at the second group down, eligible uh, max benefit 30 years of service. Uh, those people could have retired right then, maxed out their benefit, etc. How many actually retired? If you go back into the presentation we gave you, it shows that of the eligible folks who could retire, only 20 to 25 percent do retire. So what I did is I took a look at uh, those people that they retired during the year of FY21, and a quarter of them did. So I took a look at them specifically and said, what if they didn't retire? So if they didn't retire, um, by the way, their average final compensation was around 85,000. I mean, their average pay at the end was 85,000. Their average final compensation <laughs> is always a little bit lower because your average over the last three years is around 82,000. Um, if they did not retire, uh, uh, 
the state, the retirement system would have continued to get the 21.4%, which is about $18,000. They would have continued to get the 6.65%, which is around $6,000. I'm just rounding things here. Um, they would have avoided paying out the, the pension, uh, which at max is 41,000, and they wouldn't have to pay the health insurance, which for this group would be about 12,000. You add those up, you get about $77,000 if the retirement system gained by not having those people retire. So what's the incentive of the employee to not retire? Um, if you have the employee not pay that 6.65%, they, that's about six thousand dollars. Now they're not going to get that full amount because that would be taxed, but still be a considerable amount of money for them to not retire. The net to the the net to the retirement system would be around seventy one thousand uh, dollars for these people to not retire. If you did that incentive and it incentive these people. If you just took a quarter of that number, the number is about 126 people. Um, it's about 112 people. Um, if you took a quarter of that number, so don't even assume all of them are half of them. It took a quarter of them. It could, it could save the retirement system about two million dollars. Now, I'm not an actuary, so there's some caveats. One of the benefits, um, and I had to write these down so I wouldn't forget. Uh, one of the benefits. To the system is by doing this, you're not increasing their average final compensation. You're just allowing the person to, to not have to pay into the system. But uh, since they get to stay, you know, stay as an employee, there are usually what folks call colas or across the board increases. So that would increase their pay a little bit, and that would affect their average final compensation. Um, on average, this group is 60 years old. So the health insurance amount that is avoided by retirement is, is a pretty sizable amount. Yep. Um, and um, it also would allow the system to allow the person to get one year closer to Medicare. Medicare costs, uh, the health insurance is maybe a third, if not less, than the active the active. Um, this data is based on the 21.4 percent that was in effect in FY20. Now you know it's 25.5 percent in FY22. So the savings, if you apply that, would be more like 75,000, 2.1 million, or something like that. Uh, not all employees would take the full, the maximum 50 percent. Uh, uh, survivorship has been discussed in this committee, but they can take less if if they want uh, to save their spouse to continue their benefit after they die. So this is definitely an actuary thing. Uh, my guess is it may all sort of come out and wash, you know, same amount of money. I don't know. Um, keeping these employees will admittedly continue to cost the state a fair amount of money on the employer side, um, but you can save it on the retirement side. So that's a suggestion uh, for a small contingent where it might be able to save some money. But yeah, but not only would you say that it's an incentive for the employee to stay longer, and with the uh, aging demographics and the uh, the the changing demographics, so the baby boomers are aging out of the workforce, and there's not the younger people coming in to fill that workforce. It, it would help the state could it potentially help the state with. Um, with just our, our recruitment, our not having to recruit to those particular jobs. So it's just, it's, it's one idea of, there's, you know, many, many scenarios that could help, but we just, it's just something that uh, we just think it would be worth the committee looking at those types of things as well and asking the actuary to provide some information on that just to help help with some of the decision making and plan going forward. I just want to thank you for that because um, when, when we had the OPEB um, presentation last time, I was leaving thinking a lot about how could we give people 
sequence and it's sustained, it could work in the teacher system too. I think I really appreciate your um, yeah, representation on it. Yeah, I think it could save money on the OPEP side, the pension side, yeah. and the employee gets an average amount. Right. Many people retire and then go and get another job. But if you love your job that you have now and we can give you a little bit of an incentive to stay, it's worth exploring. Thank you. Thank you. As we go forward, we may end up having more questions. But, and I also would encourage you to look at the whole workforce report because it is pretty illuminating thank you thank you oh okay okay so we're going to um jump to some demographics on the teachers side here is that you? Okay. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. <laughs> didn't recognize you, so I thought maybe. <laughs> okay. So while uh, while we're switching chairs here, um, we'll just acknowledge that um, our way of collecting demographic information on the teacher workforce is is slightly different because it, the teacher workforce is made up of dozens, hundreds of different employers, uh, as opposed to the state workforce where we have one HR department. So um, you can just hand them and just, we'll just pass them down. The, yeah. We'll, uh, Yes. Put in up to nineteen twelve one thousand dollars a year. The I know all right, let's jump. I believe you're Mark Hague. I am Mark Hage. Yes. Hage. Hage. Okay, great. And I am uh, the director of benefit programs at Vermont NEA. Been in that position for a little over 20 years. And I'm a former school teacher and Interest of full disclosure, a member of the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System. Okay. And so, I, I think that before you start, that because you weren't here when we introduced ourselves, and I think it would be helpful if you knew, because we are all appointed by different entities. Thank and you. It might be helpful for you to know where we're coming from. That would so, be helpful. Michael, if you want to. Good to see you. Andrew Emmerich, Vermont NEA. Eric Davis, VSEA. Jeanette White, appointed by the Committee on Committees. Sarah Copeland Hansis, appointed by the Speaker. John Gannon, appointed by the Speaker. Katie Gannon, appointed by the Speaker. Leon Watt, VSEA. Dan Trotter, uh, Troopers Association. Corey Perry, appointed by the Committee on Committees. Thank you. I should also add to my introduction that I am here today strictly in my capacity as the trust administrator, a trust administrator of the Vermont Education Health Initiative, VHI, which provides health benefits to school districts and to visitors. Normally, um, when I'm in this building presenting about VHI matters, I'm accompanied by my colleague, Bobby Joe Sauls, but as you will see in the introductory statement in the document that is in front of you, she is taking a much deserved vacation this week and so i am running solo um i also want to say that the numbers that i'm going to review with you today are exclusively from blue cross blue shield of vermont i had initially attempted to fuse 
numbers between Vistas and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and discovered that the differences between them were quite negligible and it required a lot more narrative to explain the differences than you probably have time to hear about and that I could probably make clear for you. So there is a line here, however, that says certain figures were provided by Vistas. When I made the decision not to include the Vistas numbers, I neglected to delete that sentence. I will do so after this hearing and send you a clean copy and a correct copy of this document. So I was asked to provide a very nice prep conversation with Representative Copeland Hansis, aggregate data on the number of school employees and dependents in the active workforce who are enrolled in VHI benefit plans and the number of retirees and their dependents enrolled in VHI health benefit plans through VISTERS those who are not yet Medicare eligible and those who are enrolled in Medicare. And you will see at the bottom of this page, two tables that lay out those numbers for each of those populations respectively. So in respect to the active enrollees and their dependents, we have in total as of July 1, 33,393 school employees and their dependents in active VHI benefit plans. And you can see here the breakout between employee subscribers and dependents. In the VHI world, when we talk about subscribers and dependents together, we refer to them usually as covered lives. So there are 33,393 covered lives through the active workforce that get their health insurance through their school district and thus through VHI. Now you'll notice there are 14 people for whom Medicare is primary, even though they are active employees. And that's unusual because if you have employer-sponsored coverage and you are Medicare eligible, but you're still working, if you enroll in Medicare, it's usually supplemental. The employer coverage is primary. In this case, it's primary for the small number of people because some of them have disabilities or they have end-stage renal disease, which qualifies them for primary Medicare coverage, even though they are continuing to work. And then there are some COBRA implications here as well that allows Medicare to be primary. If we turn to the VISTERS population, looking at retiree enrollee and dependents, you will see at present Medicare enrollees 7,622, that is subscribers and dependents combined. Medicare doesn't offer two-person plans the way active workforces are entitled to them or have access to them. So if you're the spouse of a Medicare retiree and visitors, you have a single Medicare plan, if you will. Your spouse, the retiree, has a single Medicare plan. 7,622 enrollees and dependents, Medicare eligible for the non-Medicare, significantly smaller number, just under 1,100 for a total of 8,720. I want to speak to the um, volatility, if I can, of the numbers in the active workforce. Volatility is probably not the right word here. What I want to say is, from a month-to-month -month basis, these numbers can vary pretty dramatically. They can rise or fall upwards to 300 in the space of a month. So, for example, in, on July 1 of 2020, there were 35,000 um, active enrollees, active school employees in VHI. At the end of open enrollment in December of 2020, there were approximately 33,300 people. So these numbers can really vary for the reasons you would expect. People are born, people die, they get married, they adopt children. Their children go on or off the health insurance plans. People are hired, people's employment terminates for various reasons. So there's a lot of flux or can be. However, and this is a consequence of speaking with Representative Copeland Hansis, I went back and I looked at the average number of members in the active workforce over a four-year period, 2017 to 2020. And what I found is that the average was within a span of 34,300 and 34,600. So when you look at the numbers on average over the course of a year, at least for those last four years, we haven't seen a lot of um, uh, change but on a month to month basis, that is not unusual. So why don't I pause there for a moment and see if you wanna talk about these numbers or have any questions about them. Talk in the, in the Medicare enrollees, the sure. 6.2. So that includes spouses as well as retirees. Right, correct. Okay. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, Andrew. Uh, the 13,960, is that including ESPs or is that just um, people on professional contracts? That's every school employee. It's every teacher, that's a good question. Teacher, support professional, administrator in any capacity, unionized and non unionized. Uh, Correct. They're, they're less than 65, and I get eligible for many. Well, if you have any other questions about the numbers, you can. Yeah, please, Mike. Have we talked about the active workforce? Yes. yes. Does that include people who are not part of this district retirement Yes. So Correct. It's every school employee, regardless of job classification, who meets the eligibility threshold for coverage under either the collective bargaining agreement or um, their local individual contract or the terms of statewide bargaining. So that would include employees of the school district who are members of their municipal retirement That is correct. In fact, it would include a large number. Okay, again, please feel free to come back to these numbers at any point. And if there's additional numbers you need from VHI uh, or from VHI investors, um, Michael and I have worked together a lot of years and I've worked with his exceptional retirement specialist. Um, if those numbers are needed and you need to get more granular with them, please let us know, we'd be happy to oblige. So on the flip side of this front page, I um, thought it might be helpful for you to have a sense of the health insurance plans that enrollees in VISTERS can choose both prior to Medicare eligibility and once they are enrolled in Medicare. So for those approximately 1,100 individuals in VISTERS who are not yet enrolled in Medicare or eligible for Medicare, there are three primary plans that are available to them. And you can see them here, the Vermont Health Partnership, the $300 comprehensive plan and the JY plan. Now these plans were available to most school employees in virtually all school districts prior to January 1 of 2018, when VHI transitioned to four new plans, high deductible health plans predominantly, at which point these plans were no longer available to school districts um, but they remained options for the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System for the non-Medicare population. The Vermont Health Partnership, VHP, is a managed care product. It was by far the most popular plan for active school employees before it was no longer available at the end of 2017. The 300 comprehensive plan has exactly the same benefits and networks by networks, I mean the doctors, you can see the hospitals, you can get care at, et cetera. Um, same pharmacy networks and benefits. It's identical in networks and it is identical in um, benefits to the JY plan. Those two plans are identical. Right? So no difference between them except how cost sharing is structured. So that $300 in the title references a $300 deductible upfront, first dollar that the employee or patient is responsible for, for all medical services, except preventive services that come at no cost under federal regulations or law. Um, there is an additional $300 of co-insurance annually, in addition to that deductible for single tier coverage. So what that means is in a calendar year for this particular plan, worst case financial scenario, the Enrollee has an out-of-pocket liability maximum of $600. Now, again, that is just for medical care. This plan also has a three-tier pharmacy program, $5 copay for generics, $25 for preferred medications, $45 for brand name medications. And that is true for the JY plan as well. So if I have a single tier coverage, I'm looking at, as I said, a $600 maximum out-of-pocket liability in the calendar year. And if I have two-person coverage or family coverage, I'm looking at a $1,200 maximum out-of-pocket liability under the $300 comprehensive plan. 
In the Vermont Health Partnership, almost all of the services, I think actually all of them, come with some kind of copay. I think it's $15 for primary care, $25 for specialty, $15 for telemedicine, $50 for an ambulance service, um, $25, I believe, for uh, maternity visits, et cetera. And it has the same pharmacy benefit as the 300 com $5 for generic, $25 for preferred, $45 for brand name medications. And it operates um, within a slightly tighter medical network, but not significantly so than the 300 comp. Vermont Health Partnership requires you to designate a primary care physician. Um, both of those plans um, were introduced, I believe, in the mid to late 1990s. So they've been around for some time. The JY plan has a much longer lineage. It goes back to, I think, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, it was initially the JYA plan, then it became the JYB plan, and then it was the JY plan. It changed a little bit with each evolutionary move. Um, it too, like the Vermont Health Partnership services require, most services require a copayment, a modest copayment of $15 or $20. There is a deductible, I believe, for um, medical durable equipment of approximately $100. I think there's a deductible and coinsurance too for private duty nursing. But for the medical services that most people need on a regular basis, it too is a co-payment. It's essentially an old style indemnity plan. Um, and as you can see, uh, the number of covered lives in it uh, is quite low. It has been shrinking pretty dramatically uh, over the last 10 years. And I think there's a couple of reasons for this. First is the premium is significantly higher than it is for the 300 comprehensive plan. And, but it does not offer additional benefits nor expanded access to medical care. And over the course of the last 20 years, I have been working with the retirement specialists at Vistas to sponsor uh, and present retirement workshops on the benefit plans and pension services and pension plans of Vistas. And we have really stressed over those 20 years that people be as informed as they can be about why they're making the choices they do between health insurance plans. It's very common for folks to presume that a higher premium means more benefits or better benefits or expand in networks. And that is simply not the case here um, for a number of historical reasons we don't need to get into. Um, and I think what we have seen over time is the benefit of that education, both through the workshops, through the very fine work of the Vistas retirement specialists, and also through VHI's educational efforts independently. Um, and I think folks have realized that, you know what, I can get really good care through the 300 comp or the VHP plans and pay significantly less. And thus we've seen a lot of migration out of J1. Eric. Mark, uh, process question. You mentioned that all, you know, that all active teachers used to be in the my health partnership. Now they're in something else. When a teacher retires, do they then choose one of these options? Is that how it works? That is correct. So if I'm in the gold CDHP plan now offered by VHI, where, where most active employees and dependents are enrolled, um, when it comes time to retire, and this is something we, we stress a lot at the retirement workshops, um, I will have to apply for or enroll in through the application process through Vistas, one of these three plans, if I'm not yet eligible for Medicare. So every active employee is going to be in a different health insurance plan once they transition to Vistas, assuming they elect health insurance through Vistas and they're eligible for a premium subsidy. Please, just making sure here so that I don't assume anything when you talk about uh, that they have Medicare, that means they, they had a, which everyone is entitled to be 65. They purchased Part B, right? Now they don't necessarily purchase D or an advantage plan or whatever else, but those are the two that they have. And that they, uh, so that is actually a very nice transition to the next part of this um, Please uh, document. <laughs> Thank you for that. Week. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> to the point that was just made, when I become eligible for Medicare, when a retiree is eligible for Medicare and enrolls, and they're going to stay in Vistas for their health insurance, and most transition from a non-Medicare status uh, to a Medicare eligibility status with Vistas, I need to be enrolled in Part A, I need to be enrolled in Part B, and I need to show documentation of that to the retirement system. Without that documentation, 
I am not entitled to the premium subsidy as a retiree. The premium subsidy requires documentation that you have enrolled in Part A and Part B. That is mandatory. Okay. Um, the question about Part D, which is the pharmacy benefit, is a little more complicated because as you look at the first two plans for the Medicare enrollees investors, both of those plans, the 300 comp and the JY, they're the Medicare supplement version of the two plans I just spoke to. So now Medicare is primary and the J1 to 300 comp transition to supplemental status. And they, if you will, wrap around Medicare, provide supplemental services and benefits to Medicare. Thus the need for part A and part B, they have embedded RX coverage, the same RX formulary benefits and cost sharing arrangements in the non-Medicare enrollee plans are also in these supplemental plans. Again, built right into the plans. So if I, as a retiree, elect a 300 comprehensive plan, as you can see, the great majority do, then I don't need to shop for a Medicare D plan. If, however, I choose the Vista 65 supplemental plan, this is a standard Medicom plan. It's been offered by Vistas for many years. Um, it's gone through some different name changes along the way. But this plan covers medically everything Medicare covers. So if you've ever seen the Medicare and you booklet, you can, if you're Medicare eligible now, or you're enrolled in Medicare, it comes in the mail, you can download it. It's over hundred pages. And it's devoted primarily to all the medical benefits that Medicare provides. That's the bulk of the narrative in the document. And every medical service that Medicare provides, Vista 65 is supplemental to. It does not, however, provide RX coverage, not even an aspirin. So if you're in the Vista 65 supplemental plan, you're gonna have very comprehensive Medicare sanctioned care for all of your medical services, part A, part B. Part A, as you probably know, we're talking about hospital services primarily, inpatient. And for part B, generally we talk about physician services and, and hospital outpatient services. So then you need to shop for Medicare Part B. Some of you may recall when the Medicare Part D program rolled out in around 2003, respectfully, it was a mess. <laughs> um, I was inundated with calls from members who were trying to figure it out for themselves or were trying to figure it out for their parents, um, which meant I had to try to figure it out. Uh, and I have to confess, I was not very good at it. Um, the system, fortunately, today um, is much easier to navigate and to understand. And Medicare has gotten, CMS has gotten a whole lot better at counseling and providing resources. And you can find the Medicare D plan for as low as $11 a month. Now, I don't know what you get for $11 a month in pharmacy. Can't be all that much, but these approximately 1,300 people who are enrolled in Vista 65, in my experience, tend to be individuals who have very good health and they have no or negligible Rx costs. And so it is a very smart move on their part to enroll in this, particularly for people who have single coverage only because the Vista's subsidy, premium subsidy for single coverage covers the entire cost of this premium. So for folks in the Vista 65 with single coverage, no deduction is coming from their pension for premium costs. They are on the hook themselves for whatever Medicare D costs that they purchase on their own. And I have to say that um, the first workshop I ever did for Vistas, actually it was for VHI, but I was with a Vistas crowd. And there was an 80 year old woman in the audience who had the forerunner of this plan. And I said, ma'am, you understand there's no RX coverage with this plan. She says, young man, I don't need drugs. <laughs> and it, it is a lesson that has been driven home to me on any number of occasions in other workshops or in private meetings with uh, members or retirees. And so for these 1300 folks, um, this plan works just fine. And remember to, unlike the pension election for a retiree, your health insurance election as a district retiree, that first choice you make when you retire at either of these divisions, whether you're non-Medicare or Medicare, you're not locked in for life. You can move 
to a different health insurance plan over the course of your retired career. Retired career, that's an unusual phrase. Retired life. Uh, as provided you have been in the plan you elected for at least 12 months. So those 1260 people, there may come a time when their Medicare D needs are much greater than when they initially enrolled in Medicare D. And when open enrollment comes around, they can choose to move from Vista 65 to the 300 comp or the JY supplement where the RX benefit is embedded and there's a copay structure that will probably be more affordable for them. Eric, I mean, Andrew, please. Yeah. Um, so you can, once you've elected one plan, you can change the plan that you enroll in. That is right. Okay. Um, and then another question, not really related to that. Uh, insurance is definitely not my specialty. It's <laughs> just it's a tough one for me to always wrap my mind around. Um, but I'm curious what would happen, you know, there's lots of talk about healthcare reform at a state level or national level. Uh, you know, Senator Sanders is talking about decreasing Medicare age down to 60 or 50. What happens to school employee costs for health insurance if that were to change Boy. or OPEP funding? And maybe, maybe you're not. No, that is a great question. I, I, I will confess I've not yet tried to cost that out and nor has VHI. Um, I did see a national study published in Health Affairs that if I'm remembering correctly, projected that lowering eligibility to Medicare to age 60, I think it was, would save the country nationally in the neighborhood of $300 billion. Um, don't quote me on that. I can go back and look if it's of interest to you. But there's no question that if people had access to Medicare sooner, um, employers and employees would probably see a pretty significant reduction in costs because so much of the cost would then be shifted to the federal tax base. So that's Medicare. something we can take control of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Any more questions? Final comment, if I may. Um, I, was all, I was gonna bring you all a copy of the Vistas Benefit booklet. No life is complete without one. Um, <laughs> however, I discovered that I uh, did not have enough copies in my own office, which is a little embarrassing. Although the booklet is now actually being, uh, you know, as annually re-looked at again. If, so I provided the link here to the booklet if you'd like to sort of dive into the health plans uh, in more detail and see how those cost sharing structures are arranged and the benefits they're associated with. And I can also provide you with a benefit booklet link if you'd like to the active plans as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. <laughs> committee, what is your pleasure here? Do you need to take a short break or do you want to just dive into the, um, we have some mainland committee discussion now about what we talked about earlier and about what other um, information we need um, responses to the treasures. Um, I think we should take a 10 minute break and then come back and, you know, the discussion points that we listed on the agenda were just sort of our best guess at what people might want to talk about mm -hmm. or, or that we'd like to prompt people to think about, but we can certainly just come back and, and block off together. some of that time to talk about the agenda for next meeting. Thank you.